the book, Witness to Hope, this is the biography published in 1999, uh, which I recommend to people to read, not just because it's a very good biography of John Paul II, but if they're intimidated by the size of the book, which sometimes is the case, uh, I tell them it's a great time saver because if you read Witness to Hope, you get a comprehensive view and history uh, of the church in the latter half of the 20th century, of Central European history, which is you know, European history of the last century or so, uh, told through the life of this one man. And when you read the book with that background, you get the sense that it was an extraordinary providential life, that at every moment it seemed that uh, God's finger was on him, uh, including his death on the feast, liturgical feast of divine mercy, which he had in fact instituted. Uh, did he have that sense of his life, that his life was in a particular sense not generically under God's providence, but with a specific mission uh, that included the uh, history-changing, church-shaping uh, vocation that he had? He, he certainly had a sense of the finger of providence in his life, uh, often prodding him in directions that he might not wish to go. I mean, this was the first pope in hundreds of years who, until he was a young adult, <clears throat> intended to live his Christian life as a layman. I mean, he had to be prodded by that divine finger into the priesthood. He had absolutely no desire to be pope. He had spent 40 years in Krakow, 1938 to 1978. He knew how much of his own strength came from his immersion in that rich cultural heritage that is uniquely Krakowian in uh, Poland. So, he, you know, he was pushed there too. But I think he would say, were he among us tonight, that finger of providence in his own life may have taken him in some rather dramatic directions, but that divine providential calling to a unique vocation is addressed to each of us. I mean, each of us is not only a unique, if you will, idea in the divine mind, there is a specific vocation for which each of us was intended. And even if we make a mistake in discerning that, at some point along the line, the finger will point us back, if we're attentive to it, uh, to the right uh, path. So uh, he would ask us to ponder his life, not to say, oh, wow, wasn't that something? Because it was a life full of sorrow and pain as well as great accomplishment. He would say, if there's anything to learn from my life, it's that that is something you need to be attuned to in your own life. I mean, in that sense, he would say, I'm nothing special. But that vocational discernment in my case led in very dramatic directions, which I might not have chosen had I not been saying, what is God asking of me now? In uh, writing the biography, which was published in 1999, begun in 1996, uh, if you look at the notes, which are very comprehensive, uh, there are many remarks, or the notes say interview with, uh, with Pope John Paul II. Uh, we have these, we, we've adopted this format at Convivium of the Conversation because we think it uh, not only is interesting, but it also 
uh, capture something of how we seek to go about our, our witness in a common life in Canada. What was it like, uh, not so much as a research tool for the book, but what, was, what were conversations like with Pope John Paul II? What was it like to speak with him? Was he, uh, in fact, an enthusiast of the conversation? Uh, he was a man who lived in a large degree and in the human sense from conversation. Um, the Pope has, any Pope, has available to him uh, sources of information from all over the world that are probably more extensive than anything available to any other global leader. Uh, but for John Paul II, that was not enough. To go through his kind of daily brief was not enough. He had to hear it from people personally and engage them. So until his body really betrayed him um, in the last several months, um, he had guests at breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. And it was not primarily socializing. I mean, it was serious conversation, trying to learn from this array of men and women from all over the world uh, what was going on in their lives so that he might be able to discern what the Holy Spirit was doing in those lives that he might be responsive uh, to. Um, Beyond that, I mean, th this was utterly normal. Uh, people ask us, what was it like to have, you know, dinner with the Pope or lunch with the Pope? And I always have to say, nobody levitated here, you know? It's, I mean, this is not some strange uh, business. It's a table, there are chairs, there's food, there's uh, wine. Um, Polish sisters cooking Italian food is not necessarily a, recipe for great cuisine. Um, I love them dearly and I visit them in Krakow every summer, but um, you didn't go for the, for the kitchen. <laughs> um, and there, you know, there were obvious normal facets to this. It wasn't all high politics or high theology or uh, church affairs all the time. The last time I saw John Paul II was on December 14th or 15th, 2004. Uh, my father had died six weeks before. The Pope had sent a message uh, to the funeral, which was very kind. Uh, but he was in pretty tough shape himself at that point, and I didn't expect him to remember that my dad had died six or seven weeks before. And the first thing he said to me when I walked into his dining room, he was, in those days, they'd get him to the table and then you would come in. Uh, the first thing he said to me was, how's your mother doing? I mean, that pastor's sense of uh, the human circumstance was was very much alive all the way till the end. I do believe we are heading into very challenging times in the Western world. And while those of us of Christian faith enter that with a certain sense of relaxation and that we know that what we celebrate on Easter uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, that's the victory that has already been won. Uh, we know how history is going to end. Uh, it's going to end in an endless party called the Wedding Feast of the Lamb. So we can relax a little bit about how we conduct ourselves here and now. We don't have to win, we just have to be faithful. Uh, but it would be nice to win <laughs> occasionally. 
and to take, uh, it would be nice to make the best of these grand experiments in self-governing democracies uh, that we have been, that we have inherited in the Western world. Uh, and in doing that, we need to remember that the only thing to be afraid of is thoughtlessness and pusillanimity.